is the producer and or director of seven documentary feature films, including For Our Day, Divinely Sanctioned Governments, For Our Day, Covenant of, on the Land, and Statesman and Symbols, prelude to the restoration. She helped direct her first documentary at the tender age of 16. Hannah is the director of the Joseph Smith Foundation. She is a popular speaker, podcast, and radio guest, and author of several books, including A Christ-Centered Home and the Faith Crisis Series. Hannah has worked a, as a history and literature teacher, agriculturalist, and research assistant, as well as in several other fields. Now I'm gonna raise the mic up. Uh, one more round of applause for Greg. Thank you so much for your words. Looking forward to the rest of the program. Um, I really appreciate all of those, uh, all of you that took off your Saturday afternoon um, to care about the subject, and I hope that um, what I've prepared to share today can give you something, not just hope, but hopefully some answers and something to go forward with um, as you leave today. So I want to start with a story of one of my ancestors that I actually only learned about when I was about 12 or 13 years old. Uh, we had a family history line that we could just not push back. It just died in the 1700s, which uh, for some may be like, well, all of my lines died in the 1700s. But for us, that was really uncommon. All the rest of our lines were just really easy to push back. But this line just died, this Guthrie line. And my dad was one day studying a book, reading a book on the Scottish Covenanters. Um, I'm just curious. I'm not really expecting anyone to have heard of the Scottish Covenanters, but I'm just curious. Has anyone heard? Okay, we have like one or two hands. Um, us too. We've never heard of them. Um, my dad's reading this book, and he has this impression as he comes across this chapter that talks about this man named James Guthrie, who was beheaded for his faith in Scotland and this stand that he took for freedom, both for the Kirk or the Church. Um, and also for religious freedom in Scotland. And as my dad was reading this chapter, he had this impression, that is your ancestor. Start with him and move forward in time. Move, move, to the, move forward and you will find how to connect that line, which he did. And suddenly that line unlocked. And we discovered that James Guthrie was indeed our direct ancestor through his son, William. Well, I'd like to tell you his story because his story when my dad discovered this ancestor when I was 12 or 13 completely changed my life. So James Guthrie, um, the, the, his story, I'm, I'm gonna start actually on the day he dies. Um, he is in jail, he's about to be executed, and the jailer brings in his two young children, his five-year-old son, Willie, and his younger daughter, Sophia. And this is the last time they're going to see their father. They're crying. Um, you can imagine the scene. And James picks up his little son, Willie, and he puts him on his lap. And he says, Willie, the day is going to come when they will cast up to you that your father was hanged. In other words, they're going to say to you, like, yeah, your father was the one who was executed. Your father was the one that was found guilty at that trial. And he says, be thou not ashamed, lad. It is in a good cause. What was this cause James Guthrie had been fighting for? Um, James Guthrie, as I mentioned, was a Scottish Covenanter, and the Scottish Covenanters were in the 1600s. And what happened was the King of England was attempting to take over the church and take over, well, they already were having liberties infringed, but he was stepping in more intensely and saying, this is what you can and cannot preach at the pulpit, and this is what you can and cannot say. And a number of men stood up and said no, and as from studying the Bible and from studying and taking it more seriously, this is part of the Reformation, so this is a similar time frame to William Tyndale and Martin Luther and others, they drafted this national covenant where they said in the Bible, the people of Israel made covenants with God, and when they did, God blessed them. But to make that covenant with God was more than just saying, oh, we're God's people and we believe in God. 
They cleaned up the morals of their society. They stood for liberty and they fought to make sure that gospel message could be taken to the entire world. And they said, this is what's going to happen in Scotland. They said, the Scottish people are going to make a covenant with God. They drafted this document. They called it the National Covenant. And James Guthrie was one of those men that came. He was just a young man. He was in his 20s. And he, um, he, he's on his way. He's only 26. So he's on his way. It's in February to Greyfriars Kirk in Edinburgh, Scotland. Which if you go to Edinburgh, you can actually see it today. But he's on his way to this church where they're all meeting. And you can kind of think of this meeting as very similar to the, when the signers of the Declaration of Independence came together to sign that document. What they're doing is risky. What they're doing is signing this document is tantamount to basically giving your name to the king and saying, we reject your ability to control us. We are rebelling against it. Um, here's our names. X marks the spot. Shoot here, right? So that it's, it's a very dangerous and risky thing. Well, as James Guthrie is heading into the kirk, into the church, he happens to run into and almost clash right into on the street, none other than the city executioner in full dress. And it startles him for a second. It really just takes him aback. And he, then he takes a deep breath and he goes into the church and he does the deed. And as he laid down his pen that day, he had a premonition, and he said, I know I'm going to die for what I've done this day, but I cannot die in a better cause. Well, he did die for what he did. Um, and, but his, his message before he died, um, he wrote, I really appreciated um, the message right before me because this emphasis on, we're always talking about political freedom and we're always talking about liberty, but we need to realize that until we repent individually and as a people, not in general, it's always easy to point to everyone else and be like, yeah, if our society would just clean ourselves up, but it comes to every single one of us in our homes and in our personal lives. And that was something that James Guthrie was very emphatic about in the Scottish Covenanters. He wrote a book called The Causes of the Lord's Wrath Against Scotland. And in that document, he outlined, he said, where we have profanity, we are not taking God seriously. The fathers in our homes are not leading their families in prayer. They are not being serious about their faith. We are not visiting the poor. We are not taking these duties seriously. And he called the people to repentance for that, realizing that until that was corrected in their society, they could not have freedom for the church. Well, James Guthrie, to kind of cut a very long story short, um, he gets imprisoned, he's put in front of a trial, he defends himself so well that several of the men at the trial actually left. They said, we're not gonna have any part of this, this guy's innocent. Um, and then he, but he was sentenced to be beheaded and the day he goes to be beheaded, he gets up on the scaffold and he gives a sermon for an hour which he had written down to give to his son. His little son that he knew he would never be able to personally speak to it, but he wanted that generational message passed on. Um, so he, he gives this message, he's hung, they cut off his head, and they put it up on the gate for 28 years, the Netherbow Gate, so that everyone could see you don't want to end up like him um, until a man literally risked his life to pull it down. Um, and the, the story goes that his little boy would actually run every day, disappear to the gate, and just stare at his father's head for hours. And then he would go home and he would hide, and when they find him, he would just be crying like, I've seen my dad's head and I've seen my dad's head. And um, it ended up, they didn't stop there. They actually ended up exiling his wife and the little daughter, Sophia. Um, Willie um, died young and some thought that he didn't have children, but he did have children. Those children escaped to America. That was one of the reasons that was a little hard sometimes to find the lines. This was a dangerous time. Um, and those, when, when James Guthrie was executed, his executioner said, they said, we are gonna exterminate his posterity or they will be beggars for the rest of eternity. Like they will amount to nothing. Well, what did those children and grandchildren go on to do? Those, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren went on to fight in the Revolutionary War. Um, others participated in the Mormon Battalion, if you know about that story. Um, different um, 
the, involved in freedom events, Daughters of the American Revolution, very a strong stalwart um, posterity. That's what became of that beggarly um, generation. But I want to ask a question. James Guthrie was able to take a stand in his life, but he was able to pass it on, and it lasted for generations. And I would like to ask each person here, why are we struggling in our day to pass on the faith? Because when I've spoken at different Liberty events before and talked about the Constitution, I've, I brought up the point where there are so many people that are making so many sacrifices to defend Liberty. All of you are here today, but the fact of the matter is we are losing the freedom fight. <laughs> Every year we lose ground. Why is that? <laughs> A big part comes to the individual conversion, and but another big, huge part is that many of us are grounded in that faith, but we are struggling to pass it on. Where are our children? Where are our grandchildren? Because the founding fathers and most of the Ref Reformation heroes we talk about, they were the millennials and they were the Gen Zers of their day. James Guthrie's 26 when he signs the National Covenant. William Tyndale was 31 when he finished the New Testament translation. We talk about William Tyndale, right? When he finishes his translation in hiding on the continent, um, running for his life, he was 31 years old. Martin Luther was 34 when he posted the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg church door. James Madison's 29 when he drafts the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson's 33 when he drafts, when he signs and drafts the Declaration of Independence. Um, so these men were young, and they were inspired with a cause that was greater than themselves, but today, for the most part, our youth couldn't care less. So what is the difference? So I don't have a ton of time today, but I want to just throw out a few thoughts, and each of these thoughts you could talk about for an hour, but I want to kind of jumpstart you into a few thoughts to go and pursue on your own. First of all, when you go to James Guthrie and when you go to the Reformers, many of whom are my ancestors, so I've read their journals and I've read their documents and I've read the things they were thinking about. They understood their identity as Israel. Now when I say Israel, I don't mean the nation state Israel. I mean um, the covenant people. And whether you believe in this room or, or um, on this lawn, I guess I should say, um, that you are a blood daughter, son or daughter of Israel or you are adopted into that covenant through the gospel covenant, Either way, you need to understand what that identity means. When you study history, we have been robbed of our history when it comes to freedom. Because when you study the history of freedom, you find out that every great movement for liberty and freedom from already back thousands of years was led by Israel and led by covenant people. Whether you look at the Germanic tribes that thumped Rome, of course, see, our history has been written by Rome. Our history has been sabotaged really by the atheist enemy but if you actually go into what they're trying to cover up if you go into the archaeology the things that have not been covered up and you go to the the the, the brave scottish freedom fighters you go to the germanic tribes you go to parthia how many of us have even heard of parthia parthia was a superpower that was keeping rome in check in her day and you study parthia they were advanced, they had technology, they had batteries, but more than that, you study their civilization, they were living Israelite codes of law. There's very good evidence that they were that they were branches of Israel that had gone off over into the Middle East. Um, you, they were living Mosaic laws. Um, so of course, this is during the Roman Empire time, also into the time of Christ. There's some amazing books. If you look up Stephen M. Collins, um, he is a Messianic Christian, and his books are absolutely phenomenal, filled with archaeology. But they he document that the freedom has been preserved for thousands of years, not by atheists, not by people who were apathetic to God, but by men and women who love God with all of their heart and soul, and that is what drove them. When you go to the Reformation, there's a book called From Tyndale to Madison, it debunks the idea that our freedom fathers went to the Enlightenment and went to secularists, secularists to fight the American Revolutionary War for freedom. 
They went to the Reformation. It was the Reformation. It was God. It was the Bible that gave the founding fathers the principles of liberty that then they took and gave to us. Um, if you actually even go genealogically, like James Madison, who drafts, drafts the Constitution, he was actually a descendant of uh, one of William Tyndale's, either his sister or his niece. So it's right, it's, it's that same blood of family. Um, and the reason why this matters is because how did the founding, how did the Reform Reformation come up with these ideas of freedom, this idea of representative government? Because if you study William Tyndale, if you study um, some of these founding fathers, even John Wycliffe, who translated the first Bible back in the 1300s, he talks about principles of liberty that we recognize today if you go read our writings from our founding fathers. Well, how are they coming up with that? They were going to the Bible. And because all true light originates from God, because they were based in the scripture, they took the scriptures seriously and they took them literally and they used them as their foundation and as their blueprint. And that is something that I cannot emphasize enough. We are seeing in our day a huge revisionist attack on scripture the literalness of the bible the taking the authorship of the bible um, if you're a latter-day saint the book of mormon the book of abraham and all of scripture is under attack and our children are being fed this from day one not only just be apathetic or don't take it seriously but it cannot be trusted and we're not realizing that that battle if we lose that fight if, you, if we lose god's word we will lose everything else. How much time do I have? Because I don't have three minutes. Okay. So if you go and I want to encourage, go study the Puritans, go study the pilgrims. They are a hiss and they are a byword in our textbooks today, but they are a hiss and a byword because they were following God. Their their civil their communities had a very low crime rate. They had um, they gave their children biblical names. They named their communities after godly attributes and after um, after their Israelite, um, the prototypes they were looking to, to Israel. They succeeded. They built a nation that succeeded. If we want to restore liberty, we have to look back to our forefathers because they did it and they were successful. And we have to understand that if we do not develop a personal connection to that covenant, to the covenant of our forefathers, again, whether you believe that you're adopted into that covenant or whether it is literal. For myself, it is literal. I am both a member of the tribe of Judah as, as well as of Ephraim, genealogically. So for me, when I study the Bible, those are my people. Those are my covenants. When it says, when God is speaking to Moses and he says, you will keep this and this covenant will be ensured forever, he is speaking to us. Our children need to know that they are Israel and the Israelite connection to freedom. It's not a faith only. It's not a feeling. It's not about warm and fuzzies. It is about, it's very, when you actually, this is, this is why the Reformation succeeded. This is why the Pilgrims and the Puritans succeeded is because they took the Bible literally. And they said, okay, this is what the Bible says our laws should be. So we're going to found our laws based on the Bible. We're going to base our culture on the Bible. Benjamin Rush, who was a founding father, signer of the Declaration of Independence, he was worried about textbooks becoming too prominent in the schools because he said we need to be using the Bible as the textbook. And it worked. They built a civilization that flourished. And they form their art, their literature. So as a people, we have got to turn back. We have got to repent. And you will know if you are converted by if you are bearing those fruits. Israel doesn't do pornography. Israel is clean and refined. Israel, Israelites respect their parents, respect their fathers and mothers. Go look at all of our movies on the television screen. They are filled with disrespect and rebellion. That is not what Israel does. Israel doesn't dabble in magic and the occult. Israel is self-sufficient and independent. Israel does not engage in sexual, promiscuous, inappropriate dancing. I'm being specific here because we need to understand if we're going to actually make a difference, we have to step into the real world, step into concrete facts. Israel educates their children, as Moses said, as they walk by the way, as they lie down at night, 
with God at the center. Israel defends masculinity. Israel keeps the Sabbath day holy. Israel teaches true femininity, true womanhood. Israel lays down their life for others. And that is what the founding fathers understood. Why did those founding fathers fight that fight? <laughs> it wasn't because they were angry their guns were being taken away or they were angry about taxation. Look at the Declaration of Independence. Taxation without representation is way down the list. <laughs> it's not even a priority. What was a priority for them was the fact that the King of England was stopping them from printing the Bible, was trying to come in and infringe on their religious freedom, and they said no, because the very purpose of freedom is to take the gospel to the world, to take that message of hope and redemption and healing, not only for ourselves, but to others. And for that fight, they were willing to lay down their lives. The Founding Fathers understood that it wasn't about them. Our children need to understand that this is not about them. Freedom cannot be about us. If you're here today because you're mad about what the government is doing to you, you have the wrong heart. You need to be focused on God. You need to be focused on laying down your life, fulfilling the Great Commission. Liberty and taking the gospel to the world has cost the blood of millions. And as we sit here, it is costing the blood of millions of our brothers and sisters in China, in Korea, in the Middle East, who are fighting a fight for freedom just as important as anything we're doing here in America. And we need to stand with them. We need to turn the movement for liberty back to God, back to scripture. And I can promise you that if we will repent as a people, if we will unite together, if we will return to the foundation of truth on God, that built and gave us prosperity for thousands of years, we can be free again. And again, the point of freedom is to take the gospel to not only ourselves and our children, but to the world. So please, keep that focus in mind. Take this message to your children and be thinking, how can I give that covenant and pass it on? And I want to leave that testimony with you that I promise you, God promises in scripture that if we will turn to him he will fight the battles for us if we are losing today it is because we are not doing our part we are not turning to him if we will turn to him we will find freedom again and i'd like to close with that testimony in the name of jesus christ amen